fellow my partners in crime and you know I always say that in the nicest possible way. Thank you for joining me again today. Now this is a solved crime and I think you can probably tell by the thumbnail and by the advertisement that I've been doing this is the case of Robert Black. Now there is a warning usually at the beginning anyway on the intro that there is content within these videos that will some people will find upsetting, disturbing, you know, and so really a warning goes out with this case. Because Robert Black, now he's a Scottish serial killer, he's also a paedophile, um, he was convicted of kidnap, sexual assault, murder of four girls in the United Kingdom between the uh, dates I think of 1981 and 1986. Now this is the ones we know about, he is well known to probably have murdered maybe 1920 from across Europe and stuff. So a warning goes out with this case. This content will contain information, graphic details of child abduction, rape and murder. And so if this case is not for you, I have plenty more on here that you can choose to watch. So if you don't want to do it and you don't want to get into this, switch off now. Okay, Robert Black case. Now, Robert Black, as I said, is a serial killer, um, a child rapist, an abduction murder of these children um, and he started at a very young age and so we're going to have to look back I think first on Robert's um, childhood background and I don't know whether this um, excuses his behaviour or gives us an insight into the mind of someone like this. Um, it's, he, he's, a, he was, he's a shocking person really um, and you know he was um, sent to prison and he got a minimum of 35 years. So this is a UK case. Um, uh, Scotland, he started, I think, then he moved around, but he, as I said, he is up for many, many murders. But as with many of these murderers and these serial killers um, like this, they won't speak and he never really spoke about any of his murders at all, really. So it's very difficult, but I think from his MO and from the things that he sort of did, and how he drove around the country and uh, Europe, um, you know, suspect really, and how he dumped the bodies, he's, he's really up for, I think 19, but possibly more, possibly more child murders. So this case is the Robert Black case, the child snatcher. And this is where I think with Robert Black, when we talk about once he was caught and that's why there was a couple of trials for him, because not all the murders were put down to him at first. So I think on the 19th of May 1994, he was convicted of kidnap and rape and murder of three girls. And then he was also convicted and kidnapped of the fourth girl and earlier been convicted of a kidnapping and assault, a sexual assault of a fifth girl. There was also an abduction in there. So again, he was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Now, Black was further convicted in 1981 for sexual assault of the nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi in 2011. Now, at the time um, of his death, he was regarded as the prime suspect in the 1978 case as well, disappearance and murder of the 13-year-old Jeanette Tate. So, he is linked to many, and as I said, he was, in 2011, charged with, and, and it was found that he was um, then convicted of the murder of um, little Jennifer Cardi, and we're going to a murder a little bit later. So this case, I think this is why I want to start really at the beginning of his, not even his crimes. I think we need to go right back to his childhood to really understand this man and see how he got away with murder for so long. So let's look at his childhood. So Robert Black was born in Gramouth in Stirlingshire, and I know Stirling because my cousin lives around there. He was an illegitimate child of Jesse Hunter Black, and really the father was unknown. She never named him, she never mentioned the father. But the mother, this Jessie, was young, and she decided at that time in 1947 to have a child out of wedlock where she had no support, no government support, no nothing. She wanted to give this child 
up really for adoption because she wanted then to emigrate to Australia and then get on with her life, just forget about everything and also the stigma in them days of having a child out of wedlock um, was quite upsetting to her so she knew she had to get away. For some reason then plans of adoptions didn't happen so for the, about six months um, Robert Black was placed into a foster um, sort of home and then he was fostered then permanently to a middle-aged couple. So their surname was Tulip and then Robert then took on their name and he was known as Robert Tulip um, until he changed it later on back to Black. But by this stage the mother then had left him and moved on really with her life and that was the end of that. So Robert was in this foster care, they were a middle-aged couple, they couldn't have children themselves. This was in Scotland. Um, and by all accounts, I think um, it wasn't a great um, move for him. He was very young when he went there, a baby really. And you would have thought that these people would have appreciated having a child, you know, even to foster, permanently foster. Uh, but there were some issues there in this family. And I think we know there were some issues because of what we've been told by other people. But I think a child isn't born doing certain things that Robert Black did, you know, at a very young age. So there was something going on there. We know there was domestic abuse in that home. We know that um, Robert himself was physically harmed by them really because it was well known that he would come out with bruises on his face, his arms and everything else. The um, I think one of the things he talks about Robert in his childhood that really sticks in his mind and you know when a child brings up this sort of stuff from a very young age you know it must have affected their you know personality and how they've come forward in their life for him to remember them sort of things. Now he says when he was very young um, at Christmas time and stuff they would say to him, these foster parents, you know, the tulips, um, Santa Claus isn't coming to you this year. Not at all. Because you've been naughty. And he never did. The boy never got a present. The boy actually didn't get any love at all, I think, from this couple. You had a father, I think, that was quite aggressive. You had the mother that really was hygienically clean and everything. She was just <clears throat> over cleanliness. Um, the boy was hit, but also Robert states that he was a bedwetter till quite late on in his teens. Um, now there's many reasons why kids wet the bed, the bed and stuff, and especially stress and things like that can cause different things. And kids take on stress, and it could have been a medical problem or anything. But I think with Robert, what happened with him was as he was wetting the bed and you know <laughs> things like this they would ridicule him they would then um, rather than trying to figure out a problem to help him stop wetting the bed or whatever it would just be you know they would talk down to him they would you know take the mickey out of him they would call him names and then you have this woman this foster mother that was meant to be so hygienically clean but this boy was absolutely filthy and smelly and um, really unhygienic and that lasted actually all the way through his life. There was other things that Robert Black did apart from doing, being a serial killer, you know, a kidnapper, you know, abducting children and murdering them. There was other things that had clear signs of him being a paedophile from a very very young age. He was a very disturbed child and that carried on to his adulthood. Now because of his personal hygiene, from a very, very young age, we're talking about four, five, six, when he's at school, with his schoolmates, he was also really a target then for bullies. Um, and these were kids even of his own age. Uh, they used to call him Smelly Bobby Tulip. Um, and really, you could tell it really upset him. Now at the age of about five, um, there were some other kids around at the same age as well, in the school ground. and. Black and this other girl compared their genitals, really, triggering this thing in him about his belief that he wanted or he really thought he was a girl. He sort of then had a real fascination for then his own genitals, as even right up actually 
until very late in life, uh, until, well really, and I'll say it now, until we died. But um, there was something wrong there. There was something wrong because of his behaviour from wet in the bed and different things. Plus, I don't know, I'm going to say this, but I'm going <laughs> to... He liked to insert from a very young age, very young age, um, things into his rectum. He would also then smear feces, his feces, around things. Now, we could say it's a clear indication of sexual abuse, of course you could. Of course you could. That's the first thing, this, wouldn't it, that would come to mind. But there are other issues here with him. Uh, now, you know, I, it's, it's, and, and I'm not, you know, this is very difficult really because this man, you have to imagine this really, as this man got older, you know, 30s, whatever, 40s, he continued to do the same thing. He used to put objects up in his rectum and he had this thing that was his fetish. Uh, and also the faeces was a fetish, this smearing of it. So, you know, and he's quite open about that. And in interviews later on, he starts to open up a little bit later on in his life. Um, that's what he did. So the behaviours from a child were very telling. You see, the thing is, no one listened, did they? No one listened at all to this boy, ever, really. And I think this is why this boy um, became what he was. You know, and the, I always say, was these people made bad or created? You know, was they created, was they born like it? Certain things you can be born with, right? And the environment then adds to it. Any trauma then adds to it. And this boy had trauma in his life. So I think with Robert Black, the reason why he did all these crimes was a whole mixture of stuff. And we're going to go on now to a little bit more as he's beginning to get a little bit older. What then happened to Robert? Now, I think in 1958, both the tulips by this time have died. Uh, and then he was placed in with another foster family. He then soon committed his first sexual offence, dragging a young girl into a public toilet and fondling her. You know, he was, you know, he was only very young, what, 10, 11 year old doing this. So again, it brings us back, doesn't it, to his childhood, really. Because, you know, this insertion of things into his rectum mm -hmm. started when he was, what, eight, the latest, really, and then continued on by about 11. You know, you've had these both foster parents die, he's gone to another one, now he's into public toilets molesting young girls. Now, because of this, the foster parent he was with reported this and said she couldn't have him in her home. She couldn't trust him anymore in her home. So, in about his adolescence, he was, after that incident where that was it, she couldn't have him there, he was then placed, I think, in a mixed sex children's home. So it was for boys and girls. And that was out on the outskirts of Falkirk. Um, again, we're talking about now, aren't we, in the days where we've had many, many now, and I'll be doing a few cases on these later on, where we've had these care homes, which have been terrible for these poor children to go into. Terrible. Some of them are so, you know, you can't even speak about them, they're so bad. And as I'm researching, it's taken me a lot of time to research them, he went to one of these, actually went to two of these. And you can see what I mean now by this isn't over for Robert Black. Robert Black's abuse, really, whether he was getting it early on, is certainly going to encounter it now as he moves on through the system into these care homes run by people, well, actually run by paedophiles in them days. And uh, it was a free-for-all, wasn't it, for them? So again, at this time, he's in this mixed care home with other young girls. He then starts again now to show himself, to remove their underwear forcibly. He wanted to see their genitals. He, he had no hold back from that. He, you know, 
he just continued to do it. And he was, I think even at that age, it was a frightening prospect for these kids. You know, they're fighting this boy off who is determined to rip your clothes off and try and do things to you. So as a result of that, then he was sent again now to another one and he was sent to Red House Care Home, a high discipline because he needed it, they thought, um, and it was an all-male establishment. So in this location, Black himself then was severely sexually abused by male staff there. And he was there for three years. He was typically, for everything else that was going on with him, he was also really made to give um, oral sex to all the men who worked there and other people that were coming in to use these children on a regular basis. So now we have someone that's probably been abused all his life. Now you're in a situation where you're put in a care home with somebody else. So there is no love and attention. Now it's just more abuse. And now the abuse is disciplinary abuse, but it's also sexual abuse. So now what you've done to this man, and this man actually would never speak about this red house care home. It was that traumatising for him. But I think then that was the turning point. He was already doing certain things. But I think the turning point for him was that once he was let out of there, um, things just went bad. So 1963, this is when he was then sort of removed from there because he was older now. Um, and he was with the Child Welfare Agency and moved to another boy's home, I think, in um, Greenock and obtained a job as a butcher delivery boy. Now, this is what he says about this job. This job then gave him access because as the butchers were doing the meat, he was taking the meat to people's homes. And he said he abused at least 30 to 40 young girls at this point around this area. Um, and if he turned up and the girls were on their own and the parents were at work or out, um, he would try and abuse them sexually in, this, in their own homes. We, now, I wouldn't say he's lying, but I, no one's reported it. There is no reports. Now, whether these girls were too ashamed to report it, you don't, we don't know. But there was never reported anyway. But that doesn't mean to say he didn't do it. That means they just didn't report it. Or... Maybe it wasn't as serious as they thought it was because the thing is with Robert, he wanted just to look a lot of the time. He couldn't actually perform in that way. He wanted to look and then masturbate while doing it. So whether the girls fall, um, just never let him in again, you know, or um, if it was reported at that point, the police didn't really take it seriously because there's no actual reports on it at all. So he later said that he'd fondled at least 30 or 40 women. Fondled them, that means he's touched them. Uh, you know, and as I said, none was reported. Okay, now let's talk about Black in 1963 on one summer evening really where Black encountered a seven-year-old girl playing alone in a park. Now, even as Black got older, he continued to watch children in a park in his van. Okay, he, that was one of the things he did. And for a very, very long time, it looks like that's all he did. Or, or if, if he didn't get the opportunity. Or as I say, it's, we don't know. Because this man, really, when you think, you know, he's still quite young himself. What, 15? Maybe? Time? 14, 15? Uh, and he's now taking a seven-year-old child um, he's seen her in a park, he's waited for all her friends to leave her. He said to her, you know, there's an air raid shelter there and there's some kittens down in the air raid shelter. Come down and have a look, I'll show you. You know, they need our help. Now, once he got that girl down there, he held the girl by her throat uh, until she was unconscious. He didn't know if he killed her or not. And to tell her the truth, he didn't care whether he had. He then masturbated over her body after doing some other bits to her. Again, the physical side of it really was the, you know, I suppose beating and trying to make her unconscious, the strangulation of her. Um, she was blooded, you know, so there was some 
objects or something used, but actually masturbated over her rather than um, doing the full penetration of her. But she was seven years old at that point, and he actually left her in the aero shelter for dead at the age of seven. So this poor young girl find, eventually comes round, um, struggles to get out of this um, air raid shelter in a daze because it's dark, it's, it's very old these air raid shelters, struggles to get out of there, is found really in a distressed state walking along the street and then finally tells what's happened. So the following day Black was arrested and charged with this lewd behaviour and stuff and the psychiatric examination of him suggested that the incident was an isolated one I think because of his age I think that's why they fought it uh, I don't know today whether it got off with just that but probably probably in this country probably it's the same so um, and they gave him no treatment at all and that was it he literally got a warning like a caution for it so I think what does that do to someone when you are saying to them okay well you got away with that don't do it again you know um i think it done something to him i think it made him feel okay two things here one i sort of got away with it but i nearly got caught because i left her alive and so by letting him off on that first one by not enforcing the law what should have been done getting him psychiatric help actually talking to this man really finding out what was wrong with this man this man took that as free reign really and then decided okay next time they're not going to survive so shortly after this warning you know the slap on the hand go on off you go he then moves I think to Grammar. Uh, where he lodged with an elderly couple and worked as a building supply company. He began dating a young woman at that time. That's the only person on record that he's ever actually dated or been with. And he met her at a local youth club and stuff. Uh, and as I said, it was the only girlfriend or any woman that he has ever been associated with. Uh, and that really didn't last long. What happened was he was with her about several months, for several months, and then he, he because for him, this relationship was great. Um, he was looking something into this relationship that wasn't really there. So when he said he proposed to her actually and asked her to marry him, she said no. No, I can't do that. I can't be with you anyway because it's, um, it's this unusual sexual demands he wanted from her. Um, as I said, he liked things inserted into him. He liked that sort of thing and I think for this young girl um, it was too much for her and so after that again it's another rejection isn't it for Black you know she doesn't even though he's portraying this sexual thing because that's what he knows as being normal to her it's so abnormal so she doesn't want it it's a rejection and that's when things for him start or for others start to get worse so yeah, I think in 1969, when he was lodging there, his landlords, his old couple, <laughs> discovered that he had been molesting their nine-year-old granddaughter. Um, everywhere, every time that she visited them to their, in their household, he was molesting her, every time. So they evicted him, but they didn't want to inform the police, right? They said, they wanted to spare their granddaughter any further trauma. Now, I don't know what would have happened to him because he'd already got off on one. But what now's happened is, and I can understand where they're coming from because a lot of people do this, it's not the right thing to do really because one, the child would need some help in getting over this. But these perpetrators have got to be caught. So what did this do to Black now? He's got away with another one, hasn't he? He's molested this nine-year-old, he's abused and sexually molested this seven-year-old in the air raid shelter, but he's got off now with both. So of course he's moved away. Of course he has. He's gone. And um, 
again thinking, well, I'm free to do what I want. So shortly after that as well, Black lost his job in this builder's thing. Um, and then he returned, I think, to another part of Scotland where he had originally been to, uh, Kill Lutvin. I'm not really good with the Scottish names, I'm so sorry, but someone, I'm sure, will tell me that. So anyway, he lost his job there, and then he moved in with a married couple, and they had a six-year-old daughter. Now, again, because no one has reported this man, there's been no action taken. There was an actually a sex offenders register at that time anyway, but no one really knew him. As far as they was concerned, he was a lodger and many people and even people today take in lodgers and we don't know who they are, do we? So it's really good to have references, but see any references or anything, aren't they? Even really a sex offenders register is only as good um, if they've actually been called. Now, even in them days, if they'd had a sex offenders register, this man wouldn't have been on it, would he? Because he's got away with it twice now. So anyway, he's moved in with these people with a six-year-old child and we just know, don't we? We just know what's happened to the six-year-old child. So he stayed there and I think within a year, the Black's landlords informed the police now that he had repeatedly molested their daughter. So they found out he pleaded guilty to three counts of indecent assault against a child and he was sentenced <laughs> to a year at uh, in uh, like um, a borstal sentence really which specialised in training and rehabilitating serious youthful offenders now listen I know lots of serious youthful offenders but they're not sexual offenders again I don't think in these days you know they knew what to do with paedophiles you know, they, they didn't. They put him in with serious offences or offenders. Uh, they just didn't know what to do with them. Anyway, um, although he locally, he really didn't, he, he spoke sort of freely about his youth and adolescence, including the abuse that he had suffered. But I'm telling you, with this one, no, he wouldn't speak about it at all. I think this is the one as well that really, it was traumatising for him. Um, I think it's Palmouth, um Borstal, that's what it was called. And I think after that, in there, for that year, or the year he got, because he was a child molester, right? And we say this even today. And so you've put someone in with a serious offences, of, with other people, that's creating serious offences, but not sexual offences. Plus now, as we know with Black, he likes to insert things and do things, and he was quite open about that. So I don't think he had an easy time at this Borstal at all. I think, if anything, this was what terrorised him, and what really made him think, I'm never going to go to prison again. This is never going to happen to me again. So now we have these two... I suppose points coming into his mind is one, I can't leave him alive because I don't want to get caught. Because if I get caught, they're going to send me and I'm going to be treated like I was in this place. So now this man's gone from molestation to abduction and murder. That's a real turning point here for him. By this stage, he was a full blown paedophile. Okay, he was sitting in his or in parks, he was sitting anywhere watching children. He had a thing for children. He'd watch them. He would um, fantasize about them. He would wear children's clothes, swimming clothes and different things like this, anything that he could get, children's underwear um, that he would wear. He was fascinated with young girls. And his victims were always aged between, I think, the ages of 5 and 11. Might have been a little bit older in some points, but that was his age he went for. Kids in the park. Now, years ago, in 1960s and 70s, kids went to the park, you know. Kids played out in the streets. 
because people thought it was safe and it was a lot safer than it is now. Or is it? You know, or was it? Probably not. But the thing is, because people in them days didn't know the dangers, you didn't hear about it as much as you did now. These kids were more free, so at five year old, you might pop down the corner shop, get a loaf of bread for your mum. You might have gone to the park with your sisters and, and stuff, you know, who might be eight or nine year old, and you think you're big and you're five year old and you're off. This man would be watching everything that these children did on their swings, on their playgrounds, skipping. He loved it. He was fascinated with it. And that's how I don't understand how it comes later where he kills. I think there's a lot more earlier on because I can't see him just going from watching to doing so quickly. But there was a quick transformation, I suppose. But as I said, we don't know how many he's done. So because we don't know how many he's done, we, don't, we can only guess when he started and we know when he finished, because that's when he was called. But there's many, many before that. And I think there's many, many more that we don't know about, really, here. So in 1968, six months after his release from this ball stall, Black moved to London. They all come to London. Because I don't think he could be in Scotland anymore. One, he wanted to get as far away from this ball stall as he possibly could. I'm telling you, he really did. He didn't want to be known, he didn't want to be recognised as what he was, so he moves to London, where he initially found lodgings in a bedsit close to King's Cross Station. Now, between 1968 and 1970, um, he supported himself through various jobs and stuff. It was works and stuff, but just casual jobs and stuff. And then he was also a lifeguard in um, Hornsley swimming pool, where he was soon fired, you know, because he was fondling young girls. And um, uh, again, you know, you can, you know, we're talking about 1970s, aren't we? 68, 70. He's fondling young children. He's fondling young children in a swimming pool. He's fired for it, for it so they know it's happening but no charges were ever brought against him. So again, he's got away with that. Okay, so via this contact, if you wouldn't want to call it that, that he met at King's Cross Station or at King's Cross in this bookshop at King's Cross, Black began to collect child, and I'm not going to say pornography because that's what it is meant to be, I don't, it's child indecent images of children. All right, that's what he started then to collect. So he's now doing the watching. He's now collecting loads of it, loads of material, actually. Um, a lot of it was cut out from magazines and different things like this. And um, it may have been different formats than he'd stick a child's head on top of it. Um, it but some of these stuff included videos uh, depicting graphic child abuse, um, sexual child abuse. Of the graphic kind. Um, and as Black was this keen photographer, because he loved it, he would sometimes uh, discreetly photograph children, uh, mostly girls between 8 and 12. That was his, you know, they always say it, they're, 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 they're sort of what they want to go for. Um, and he loved, because I think that's why he loved the job in the swimming pool, because he loved swimming costumes and he loved these to dress up in these kids but you also love kids in swimming costumes like bikinis or swimming costumes and he would photograph them and he would also store these photographs of these children that he didn't know and who didn't know they were getting their photos taken with pornographic material that was locked in this suitcase now we have a lot of these paedophiles that as i said always like to keep stuff build up you know we have paedophile manuals don't we now that they're writing and all this sort of stuff and even then, Robert Black was designing his own manual, really, for himself. You know, I mean, if this was the age of digital age then, you know, God knows what he would have done with it. But at the time, it was in a suitcase and he would use it himself. And it was his own manual to bring back these memories and to stimulate him, you know, um, because that was what he liked. So anyway, at this point, he also I used to 
frequent this pub, I think, in, um, I think it's the Three Crowns in um, Stamford Hill. And, you know, he used to play darts and things like that, and he was quite a good darts player, but he was also known in this pub to sit quietly, sort of talking to himself. Uh, and then in this pub, he met this couple, an older couple, um, and there was a Scottish couple actually, so he sort of had some connection with them, so he fought, and it was Edward and Cathy Royson, and in 1972, he moved into their attic. Now the Roysons considered Black actually to be quite a responsible person, somewhat reclusive tenant, which they didn't mind, you know, if you're going to rent a room or a part of your home, you don't want these people all over you. They actually quite liked it, that it was quite, you know, reclusive and, it, you know, um, they did say, as with all the women and everyone that knew him or had ever met Robert Black, is that his personal hygiene was terrible. It was terrible. He just never washed, cleaned his teeth, there's just nothing. And as I said, he had things, you know, inserted and things like this. And um, you can imagine, can't you, the stench coming from this man. That was their only issue with him, but that's he kept upstairs doing his own thing and uh, paying the rent. They was okay with that. They sort of said, once it all come out and they was being interviewed, they did suspect him, you know, of looking at pornographic material, but not of children. They, you know, they, they just thought as a normal man of this age, he was probably looking at pornographic material out there. That's what they thought. Um, you know, it's quite a normal thing, really. For some people, they like it. But they had no idea that he was a paedophile and they had no idea what he was doing. Now, Black remained their lodger until July 1999, when he was arrested. That's that. I know he'd been murdering, kidnapping, abduction, murder, torture of his children while living at this property. And when you have a look at where he dumped these bodies later on when we go through it, it's close to this home. So now we have Black. He's got a permanent, really, address. He's quite happy there, isn't he? He can do what he wants up in this room. Then he thinks, I need to get a better job. I need to get a job, you know, <laughs> He did have this thing about cars, he did, uh, and he brought, went out and brought himself a Fiat van, a white van, and thought, right, I'm going to then do some long distance um, driving, and that's when he got employment in that. Um, but he, he, he brought the van because he wanted to make a living, but I also think he brought the van to do what he was going to do. I think. Being in a park and just now watching these kids, you haven't got nowhere to take them. You can't take them back, can he, to the property because it's not his. He had nowhere to take these children. So he's brought this van. He's then got a job that legitimises why he's got a van, doesn't it? He's out and about. He's travelling all over the country. Actually, travelling all over Europe. And um, in the back of this van was, well, you know, his kit, would you say? Or could you say for that? And also in this van there was children's clothing, there was lots and lots of different stuff in this van that not that he took from them children, but what he used to dress up in. There was a mattress, there was ropes, there was um, tape to tape the mouth up of these children. This man was now preparing to abduct and murder. That's what he was doing. Because it wasn't enough now just to look, just to get the indecent images of children, the videos were no longer enough. Now this man, this paedophile, serial killer of children, was preparing to just do that. That's what he was doing. And that's what this job was always about. Now he was the first one, you know, when a job come through, to drive to Europe and do a job, drive to Ireland, and do a job because the rest of his driver was married and tell it true they didn't want the long distance driving he loved it he loved it because what did that do that gave him an opportunity then to go all over england scotland and wales and northern ireland and ireland and europe in hunt for victims now as he was doing these crimes he would try and change them to reduce the chance of getting identified. He would wear eyeglasses and different shape eyeglasses. He'd have quite a, an array of them really. He would adjust his appearance. He would 
grow a beard, then he would cut it off or shave it off or half shave it. These different things he would do things to change his appearance every time he was going to abduct a child. So if he was seen, people would give a different description of the one before. So he was very clever, wasn't he? So he comes across an interview as this person that really doesn't, you know, you could say, I know, he doesn't want to say much and he's elusive and he didn't want to say about his crimes. Oh my God, this man planned all this. He planned it and he was very good at it because he got away with it for a very, very long time. Okay, let's get on to the murders now. So the first murder that Black was proven to have committed was the murder of nine-year-old Jennifer Cardew, who was abducted, sexually assaulted and murdered on the 12th of August 1981. Jennifer was last seen by her mother at 1.40pm as she cycled to her friend's house uh, and that was in County Antrim. Uh, she never arrived. Hours later, little Jennifer's bicycle was discovered less than a mile from her home, covered and covered with branches and leaves to hide it. Um, the stand of the bicycle was down, so they knew then that Jennifer had spoke to someone because she's put her bike stand down. It's like she's talking to someone. She's got off the bike. Uh, and that's sort of how they knew then that really she was taken. Um, the search for Jennifer was 200 volunteers and they found nothing. Now we're talking about Black, quite a big man, very fast. And I think what happened with Jennifer was, as Cardi, as, as she was coming, as Jennifer was riding down between her house and her friend's house, he pulls up in his van. You know, he's been delivering, hasn't he? That's what he's, he does. Now she's nine years old. <laughs> you know, she's in County Antrim. Nothing really in this area has been going on because he's just passing through. Jennifer was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He's literally picked Jennifer up. He's threw her into the back of the van. Now, now we know what he does with each of these children. What he does is he gets them into the back of his van very, very quickly. He's all prepared, you know, the mattress. He's then got a sleeping bag. He's then got a pillowcase. He's got the tape. So first of all, he tapes up their mouth. Then he puts a pillowcase over their head. Then he chucks them into a sleeping bag and zips it up. Now these kids can hardly breathe now, right? They can hardly breathe. Then he picks them up in the sleeping bag and he throws them across into the van. So now they're injured. Then he gets in his car and he drives off to a place that's safe where he can really hurt, rape, molest his children. That's what Robert Black done. It was all planned. It had to be. And it was done in seconds. The picking up. You know, you're talking about young children with this man. They didn't stand a chance. And literally, poor little Jennifer Cardi was gone. And was probably dead in a matter of an hour or two hours at the most. Six days later, uh, two anglers discovered her body in a reservoir near a lay-by in Hillsborough, 16 miles from her home. The pathologist noted that there were signs of sexual abuse on both her body and her underwear. The autopsy concluded that she had died of drowning, most likely accompanied by a ligature strangulation. Now we already know, don't we, that he likes to strangle. This time he's used a ligature of some sort because from the first one in the shelter, when he was very young, he was left for dead. So he knew then that the hands weren't enough. He didn't have the strength. It takes a long time to strangle someone, you know. It's not that easy. So now he's using ligatures to strangle a nine-year-old child to death. Um, now she had a watch on. Now that watch stopped at 5.40 p.m. So they knew the time of death, 5.40 p.m. 
Now her body was found, I think, near a major arterial road and that was between Belfast and Dublin and that led to police to suspect really that her murder had, her murderer had been familiar with that area. Well he was because he was a driver. He drove all over. He loved it. That was his thing. That's how he could get away with it. So the reservoir in which her body was found was near the route frequented by long distance lorry drivers. So there was clues here right early on that this man was a driver. Now in the 70s you had a lot of this driving, you know, a lot of people delivering driving, you know, all over the country. So they knew, really, they knew that was it. And it was only yards away actually from the lay-by that suggested that the killer may have travelled extensively in this route, which he had once he'd been found out and it was then looked at where he had travelled to and from and how many times he'd been at. He knew this area. He knew it. But he was an opportunist killer. But he was always prepared for the opportunity. Now Susan Maxwell, now this was Black's second uh, confirmed victim. She was 11 year old uh, and it was Susan Claire Maxwell and she lived in Cornhill, uh, Cornhill on Tweed uh, on the Anglo-Saxon, bo uh, Scottish border actually she lived. So Maxwell was abducted on the 30th of July 1982 as she walked home from playing tennis at Coldstream where she was last seen at 4.30 p.m. crossing the bridge over the River Tweed and was likely abducted literally just shortly after crossing over the bridge. Again the search was mounted the day after this really. It, um, it was, uh, they had search dogs, there were 300 police officers. Um, they searched I think about 80 square miles for this girl, nothing. So several re people did report seeing a white van you know in the locality of it and one said that the van had parked up in a field or a gated field and right sort of next to it and on the 12th of August Maxwell's body was found by a lorry driver and her body was covered in undergrowth and she was her clothes and her shoes and her underwear were also removed. So in them days six days out in the open you know the decomposition was there so it was difficult to know how she died and exactly when she died um, but um, she, they, they sort of feel now as they look back on this case that she probably survived um, over 24 hours because of the way you used to deliver things and so you do you either killed them just after or just before a delivery he done and also it went on to petrol seats there's a lot in this man's mind we talked about people keeping you know, um, keepsakes to victims. He kept petrol receipts, and we'll go into this a little bit longer in a little bit of time because um, it, it just shows his mind, doesn't it? Killers don't always need something of yours to remind you of the kill. Just the area, just a receipt with petrol is enough to bring back their memories, to stimulate their feelings. So now this is where it gets confusing for the police, you see because this body was dumped 264 miles from her home of where she was abducted. 264 miles. So they know, don't they? You, you know it's someone. So the following day, Black returned from Glasgow to London and that's where he disguised that body. But he'd made deliveries in Edinburgh, Dundee and Glasgow. So they, they know that she was either dead or alive in this man's van for 24 hours and then he's drove back this is how confident this man is 246 miles <laughs> or six, sorry 264 miles before he dumped her body well planned he was so sure he was never going to get caught this man okay so little Caroline Hogg now five year old Caroline was and she was the youngest known victim that disappeared by plane outside her beach lane home in Edinburgh, suburb of Portobello, uh, in the early uh, evening of 8th of July 1983, when she failed to return home by 7.15. Of course, her family then were absolutely, you know, they knew something had gone on, and um, literally they searched the surrounding streets. Everyone was searching. Uh, the boy said that he'd seen Caroline, a young boy said that he'd seen Caroline with a man in the nearby promenade which they'd searched 
and um, they never found her. Now in this search, I think it was um, one of the largest searches actually in Scottish history for this child at the time. There was 2,000 local people that came out and tried to do everything they could to find this child. They were all volunteers. There was 50 members, I think, of the Royal Scots Fusilage searching this Portobello. Um, and really, it really expanded their scope then to Edinburgh. But now when we look back at Black's crimes, we know that she was probably out of this area very quickly. By the 10th of July, um, this, her disappearance really had hit the headlines across the UK because of her age and stuff. And plus there had been others, hadn't there, that, you know, really were hitting the news, but in different areas because they were all spread out. They wasn't really connecting, were they now? So listen, we knew now that there was this paedophile out there um, and nine actually paedophiles were identified in this Portobello area and on the 8th of June or July actually, all of them really were eliminated. They'd gone through the lot. It wasn't any of them, but at that point there was already nine known in that area. There was many witnesses here really that said that there was um, a man, a white man, um, very unkempt, you know, unkempt and uh, balding, which he was. Uh, he looked a bit fatigued because he'd been driving. This man just drove, drove, drove. This is what he did. He was driven, actually, because one, he knew that somewhere on one of these drives that he was going to find a victim, and then he had the victim, and then the adrenaline kicks in, he's got to get away. Of course he's fatigued. He's... Of course he looked fatigued. Anyway, the man was wearing this horned rimmed glasses. Do you remember what I said? He had this collection of glasses and he would change the glasses and his look as if that's going to make him look really different. Either grow his beard out, shave it off. But these were horned rimmed glasses. So then the police then, haven't they? They put out, you know, uh, e-fit or whatever they want to call it in them days. I don't know if they did e-fits, but it was something in the paper about the description of this man they're looking for with these rimmed, you know, horn-like rimmed glasses. But he already changed them. He had an array of them to change. Again, he used to like to come across as stupid, this black. But this was very well planned. So we have one of these um, witnesses, and she was a 14-year-old girl actually, and her name I think was Jennifer Booth. And she said that she'd seen Caroline and Black sitting on a bench and she heard Caroline say, oh yes, you know, then the two got up. He held her hand as she walked along and there was a fair ground over the ride with a carousel and that on it. And there was lots of them in them days. Um, now, Caroline had gone on this. He, he, I think he spent 15 pence on a ride for her and that's probably what he had promised her to encourage her, to entice her, to go off with him. They hand in hand, this fair, she had her ride. And it seemed, a lot of witnesses said that after the ride she seemed a bit frightened. Because now what? Now this man's given you the ride. Now he's leading her off. You have this young child, really, don't you? Caroline Hogg. Can't fight back. Can't do anything. Doesn't really understand what's happening. And that was the last time um, that she was seen alive. Now we know that Caroline also remained in Black's van for at least 24 hours. Whether dead or alive, we don't know. So Black, I think, had deliveries of these posters in Glasgow and then several hours after the abduction, then he refuelled his van in Carlisle. So he had left the scene very quickly. Um, on the 18th of July, um, little Caroline Hogg's naked body was found in a ditch close to the M1 motorway, 310 miles away from her abduction site, and just 24 miles, you know, really, from where Maxwell's, Max, uh, little Max, uh, Maxwell's body was found. So he had the dumping area, didn't he? The dumping site now was there, 39 miles, or 24 miles from the same site. As Maxwell. Maxwell was dumped. Caroline Hogg's body was dumped. Very close, the radius. When you're looking at geographic profiling, two bodies dumped in the same area. <coughs> you think, do they live close? Why is it this area? 
there's reasons why when you do geographic placement you need to try and bring everything in especially when you're talking about someone who is doing um you know lots of driving so they're doing long distance driving because it's where the bodies are dumped people dump bodies where they are familiar with where they believe they can get away with it and um, when you have two bodies dumped in the same site there's your link first of all but what the link is to him and we'll come out with that a little bit later and again because she had been found i think you know a little while later decomposition has set in it found it very difficult in them days to tell why and how she had died and what time she had died and the dates that she had died but it looks like that she probably died you know by what we know about him probably within the first 24 hours anyway she was dead but also the cause of death was it sexual assault the reason why they believe it was sexual assault is because her body was naked at that point there was no other reason why would there be that a perpetrator would remove a child's clothing for any other reason than that so we can assume what happened to her. The following March, a television reconstruction of, abduc of the abduction broadcast, appealing for witnesses to come forward. And little um, Caroline's hog father said, you know, and he was right really in what he says, you can think it's never going to happen to you, but it can. And I think he just wanted people to understand, you know, because they've lost their child and he didn't want it to happen to anyone else. And isn't it why we do these programs to give you awareness, to make sure that you understand that things happen so quickly. Sometimes most of these killers are opportunist killers and it doesn't take long, does it, to abduct a child, really, minutes. And I'll tell you now, they set this task force up and all this as they would do, you know, looking for it. We won't forget though, we didn't have CCTV, did we, in them days? You know, you're talking about, he was a long distance lorry driver, there wasn't so many cars on the road then, the roads weren't as busy, these young kids were out because, you know, and some were very, very close to their home, um, they were, just, you know, things they'd normally done, no one was looking, these areas that they was took up, there wasn't many um, eyewitnesses, and to tell the truth, I think when you read about Black and you read about him stuff, he didn't care if there was eyewitnesses on it or not. He still, then he took the other child out of a park in front of witnesses. He led her off. He then took her to the fair on the carousel. He watched her. There was no rush here for him. Then he led her by the hand back to Van Fuhrer and done what going to do and drive off. So I, I think, you know, the mentality of these people is what you've really got to really be aware of. And I think the police in them days didn't really understand when you look at profiling, really, um, it was only just sort of coming in then and um, also geographic profiling and all this sort of stuff that goes in it goes into looking for someone, a child abduction, you know, and murder, a serial killer. You know, serial killers are not stupid. They, he, this man was not stupid. He got away with it for a very long time. And I think with the police, and I think when it comes to Cardi's body, the one in um, County Antrim, wasn't actually linked to these, this murderer until 2009. 2009. They had no clue who'd done this to his child until 2009. So let's talk about this Holmes database, right? H-O-L-M-E-S. That's an information relating to both child murderers and initially logged within this card filing system. Now, <laughs> there was about over five or 500,000 index cards relating to the Maxwell case alone. So don't forget, this is way before we had digital, you know, we were all typing and doing all this stuff. That's before that. And so when you're cross-referencing, I think the case highlights the difficulty with this sort of um, card referencing system would be the Yorkshire Ripper. Now, in that case, they had so much stuff, things got lost. And actually the flaws had to be reinforced because of the amount of data they had. Now we can store all that data on a chip this big, can't we? But in these days, you see, it was done on cards. Then all of a sudden, computers started coming in, didn't they? And now this is where this sort of comes into its own because now we're putting all the information in 
to a database online, on a computer, where it can cross-reference and everything itself. So it takes out human error, but also it's much faster, the storing of it. And I think it was from the Yorkshire Ripper case that they knew, now they now knew that in a case this big where you've got a serial killer going on, that you have to have a different system. It just didn't work. It certainly didn't work in the Peter Sutcliffe case, did it, really? Now, if they had cross-referenced in there, they would have realised that Peter Sutcliffe wasn't just killing prostitutes. Actually, most of them weren't prostitutes. But because the older crimes weren't linked, like this crime wasn't linked because he got away with it, you know, there's real good things these days that you can use to cross-reference and link. And it's called a computer. It's called a database. And I think that database really is developed from this case, really. So I think at the time, this database cost £250,000 to implement, and it was implemented by the Home Office. And I think it's probably one of the best things probably they've ever done. So the information continued to be entered on this database and the police forces nationwide, and they cross-checked and all this with the data and stuff. Uh, and then I think the database was based in uh, the Child Murder Bureau in Bradford and that expanded to holding information of over 189,000 people, 220,000 vehicles and details of interviews held with over 60,000 people. Now much of this evidence didn't really help in that case at the, at the time but what it did do um, you know, it sort of come from confidential hotlines and this and that and the other and it was really, really getting established, I think, by 1984. And then the results of this, all this stuff, there was, I think, the investigations and killings of several unrelated crimes were then solved from all this collection of data and how they used the data. So for that, this case really comes into its own because that's when I think things really started to change when investigators then started to cross-reference and data and it became easier for them, really, to do their job, really. It's, you know, it's, people say, no, how can they not catch a child killer? How can they have done that? It's bloody hard. And it's really hard if a person is like Robert Black, who's totally prepared for the kill. He really is. And you're not, are you? You know, they didn't have, at the time, the CCTV. They didn't have it. You know, it's very difficult if you've got 100 people in the room even to pick a serial killer out. Impossible, really. Impossible. When you talk about millions, it's like a needle in a haystack. And that's what these people were up against. Really, really difficult. Sarah Harper, at about 7.50pm on the 26th of March uh, 1986, 10-year-old Sarah Jane Harper disappeared from Leeds suburb of Morley having left her home to buy a loaf of bread from the corner shop and literally it was a hundred yards away. I think the owner of the shop did say and comment about Harper had brought a loaf of bread and two packets of crisps at 7.55pm and that a boarded man had briefly entered the shop, moments later then left as Harper made her purchase. So again, Black is an opportunist killer, isn't he? He's walked into a shop probably not going to abduct, abduct anyone at that point. He sees Sarah Harper standing there, just paying a loaf of bed, bread, two packets of crisps. He goes then, turns and leaves, goes outside and waits. And that's as quick as it was for Sarah Harper. Sarah Harper was last seen literally alive by two young girls walking into an alleyway leading towards her, um, I think, Burnswick Place home, uh, when she had not returned home by 8.20, so it was very, very quick, wasn't it? Um, her mother, Jackie, and younger sister, Claire, they looked around briefly, searched around, thinking, where is she, on the streets, before Jackie Harper reported her daughter missing to the West Yorkshire Police. Immediately, at the centre, the search was set up. Again, you know, we had more than 3,000 properties, I think, being searched. Um, and more than 10,000 leaflets were put out and there was 14,000 witnesses uh, statements obtained but this man was already gone and this girl was already dead.
I think the police from all the witnesses had then really found out, you know, hold on a minute, there, there was another, there is a van. People have witnessed, said there's this um, white van going around. And of course it was Black's, wasn't it? He was there. Now this is where I think this case gets a bit strange. Because we already know that Black had connections to paedophilia, right? He'd, we knew because he was frequenting the shop in King's Cross, where he would go in and, you know, order his under-the-counter, you know, um, sexual offences, you know, indecent images of children, even then Daisy's videos. Now, in this case of this young girl, there was a witness that said there was two men, two men, two suspicious men, and one had, you know, which were loitering, I think, near the shop. One of them had, like, a bald in appearance, was stocky and bald in, they sort of described black. There was two men. So I'm not sure if um, Black always worked alone, to tell the truth. I'm not. Because we've done so many cases, and even when we look at paedophiles, even in them days, we look at paedophile rings, and we've had many of these, many of them. And so what makes us think now is that, you know, he would never say either because he wouldn't say anything about this case at all. But do I think there was um, other people involved in these abductions and murders? Not all the time, but definitely some of the time. On the 19th of April, a man discovered Sarah's partially dressed body. She had been gagged. She had been found floating in the river Tweed. I think her hands and that had been tied and everything, gagged and bound she was. Partially naked uh, in the River Trent near Nottingham, 71 miles from the site of abduction. An autopsy showed that she had between uh, died between five and eight hours after um, she was last seen alive. And that a cause of death was drowned in the injuries that she had received to her face, forehead, uh, neck, are most likely um, <sighs> rendered her unconscious. So this one was beaten. So there's a little bit of variation also in the MO of this case to the others. This girl was beaten, that's another reason why I think there was two. But, you know, he's never going to say, not going to get him. And that was prior to her being thrown in the water. So she wasn't dead when she was thrown in the water. She was unconscious. There's a difference. So she was raped, beaten, thrown in the water and drowned. The other difference with this murder, and this is a little bit graphic, because this child was only young, she had, though, been a victim of a very violent sexual assault. Very violent. Now, a sustained assault, and it was a long sustained assault. Now, again, this is different from the others. So, yes, I believe he did it, this one, without a doubt, because it was there, and we know he was there. But I don't believe he did this one alone. There's many reasons why I don't. Now, if he was working with somebody else, who was it? We don't know. He's never going to say. But um, on this one, different. Now, I do believe, I think, there was um, something a lot different about this case. And the eyewitness that said there was two men loitering. It was the way that she was beaten as well. It was the way that she was assaulted as well. And I think the pathology just said it was just simply terrible what happened to this young child. Uh, that assault, that sexual assault was so bad. It does make me um, believe that there was someone else involved in that murder. So again, we had many, many, didn't we, eyewitnesses, and I think uh, a few days after the body was found, further witnesses come forward and said that there was a white man with a man standing beside the door, uh, stocking, you know, balding, and that was uh, over the river saw. So again, we have this task force, you know, and they have requested actually um, there's lots of senior officers in this and that from this country as well, but they have asked for a profile from the FBI to complete this profile, and that was early in 1988. Now, also from the Holmes database, this investigation concluded that only one of these convictions of, well, for sexual offences against children would warrant further investigation. Now, this is where I will say to people when we talk about or you're looking at crime, especially sex and offences crimes or, you know, children or where they're on a database or whatever they're on. They're only ever on a database if you are caught 
or if the legal process has worked as it didn't earlier because people didn't report, he was let off with a warning, he wasn't on no database. So this profile come out and literally described um, him to a T, okay? This FBI profile was absolutely dead on with what he said about him. But then you have the police saying, well, in the database, we're only going to put in and search people that have already been convicted of crime like this. That means that you're eliminating then people like Black, the perpetrator, who hadn't been caught. And they're never going to find this man. Never. And then <laughs> you have, you know, a, a girl being abducted or tried to be abducted, uh, abducted a little while later. She was about 13, 14. Now, they had all this, this description of black had gone out everywhere and, you know, circulated everywhere. But because they wasn't looking for anyone listed on this. So as this young, another young girl, I think she was 14 year old, was walking down the, now walking down the street and she looked very young. She may have been 14, but she looked very young. She was walking down one way, her boyfriend had just crossed over and gone over there. There's a white van, out pops this man, Robert Black, and says to the girl something, oh, are you good at you know, fixing cars, or whatever he said to her. She sort of said no, and walked on, you know, attitude of a 14 year old, no, and walks on. He grabs her, but he isn't grabbing the 14 year old he thinks. He thinks she's about nine, eight or nine, because she's only tiny. Well, this girl fights. She's kicking him. She ain't getting in that van, and he tries to get her in that van. He tried everything to get her in that van. She held her feet up against the van, and she's screaming and shouting because he's tried to gag her. He's tried everything. This girl is now, and what she does is she grabs his genitals so tightly, and he lets go of her. And as he lets go, the boyfriend hears the commotion, comes running back. Now, Black then jumps in the car and drives off. That's then reported to the police. They have had a description sent out there, a profile from the FBI profilers, and it tell you the truth, it's this man to a T. Balding, fat, it'd be white, it'd be in his, you know, 30s, 40s. He'd live <laughs> upon his own. He'd probably be a van driver. It'd be a, you know, everything. And they said, no, I don't know, well, we don't think it's him. They never reported it on to the task force at all. That crime was never reported to that task force. And then another child was then abducted. Okay, let's get to this one. This is just fascinating, this part of it. It's absolutely, I couldn't have wrote this really. You know, if you was gonna do a novel or a TV thing, this ending to this case, it's amazing, really, for many reasons. So, okay, Black was arrested in Stowe on the 14th of July, 1990. Now, David Herx, a 53-year-old retired postman, was mowing his front garden. Now, he saw this blue transit van slow up uh, to a standstill. And then across the road, the driver of this van got out of his car and started to clean his windscreen. Nothing wrong with that, is it? Now, as he saw that, he then saw a six-year-old girl, the daughter of one of his neighbours, passing in front of his view. So this is what he saw. Now here's the abduction. So he bends down for a bit to clean all the glass, uh, grass clippings off his lawnmower. And then he saw, as he bent down to do that, he saw the child's feet being lifted up off the ground and thrown in to the van. Now, luckily for this child, this man then saw the driver literally hastily do everything and drive off. Now this gardener, this man, took the license plate and rang, he knew something was wrong. He took the license plate of this blue van. He rang the police. Now he's saying there's been an abduction. The van colour description, the description of black, 
you know, the registration number of the car, the vehicle registration number, they've now got it all. So, this is what's going on. So, <laughs> the police now are looking. So within minute six, police vans were there in this village. Now, um, as I think, the police were driving one way and they passed the van. So it'd been a little while, right? It'd been only a little while. I think he'd driven off or driven off to a petrol station or something. But the police were driving all over there, was looking out for this van. He really couldn't get out of this villagey type area. Um, and then all of a sudden they see a van come out of somewhere and it's him. The police car then takes off in chase, comes in front of the car, comes dead in front of the car, stops the car. Three police officers jump out. One police officer opens the door of the van and in the van, in a sleeping bag, is a child. They've got black out the car. They go to get this child out of the car. Now she's in this van. She's probably been in this van 45 minutes, something like that, not very long in this chase. He couldn't have gone far. Uh, he's parked up and he has abused his child. I'll tell you that now. Um, so the police officer literally unzips the sleeping bag and this child is struggling to breathe. She then has a um, pillowcase over her head. Her mouth is taped. She is in shock. She's also been sexually assaulted within that time. As the man, the police officer, tries to get her out of the stuff, he realises that the girl in the van is his own daughter. The police officer who had to save his own daughter, six-year-old daughter. Thank God for that man mowing the grass noticed it because this girl would have surely have been dead. So her wrists have been bound, same as the other ones. Behind her back, her legs have been tied together, her mouth has been bound and gagged. Sticky plaster again over her face, tied around her head. The stuff is just terrible, really. Now, on the route to the police station, Black said, it was a rush of blood, you know, to my head. I've always liked little girls since I was a lad. You know, I only tied her up because I wanted to keep her until I dropped off my parcels. Uh, and then I was going to let her go. Listen, and this is where I talk about Black in a, in a bit of a derogatory way, not one because he's a killer anyway, but one because I think he thinks, or he's thought, everyone was so stupid as to believe this. And I keep saying he comes across, and in interviews you hear people say about their interviewing him and this, that and the other, and he comes across. No, he's, he, he knew what he was doing, this man. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> he also claimed he'd only interfered with her a little bit. You know, he didn't have time. He was going to deliver the parcel, then come back to the van for her and finish off. Now, he'd only messed around for a little bit, turned out to be um, a terrible assault on this child. She was traumatised, this child, anyway. Uh, she had been subject to a serious sexual assault, even in that short time. So, he was then, wasn't he, you know, charged and everything sort of coming out and you had psychiatrists talking, this, that and the other, he weren't getting off this time. He never said anything, you know. He never gave them any help. They had to work for everything they got on this man. And it was about the petrol receipts in the end. They went to the company he worked for, they tracked everywhere he'd been, these petrol receipts, and as I said to you before, killers keep keepsakes, don't they, you know, of their murders. He kept the petrol receipts because that's where he had that feeling he could remember from that and the dump site of these bodies or most of these bodies was around where his lodgings were. They're in an area quite close, within about 24 miles of where he actually lived. So, you know, he was taken to court and the evidence and he was taken to court a few times for um, different charges of kidnapping, and murder and abduction and whatever else. He was, but this man was a paedophile. He was a paedophile from a very young age. He was a serial killer. He was a, an abduction and murder of children, many of them. And as I say, there's many crimes that Robert Black 
has done that we can't prove. And we'll never, never know. Now, Robert Black was sentenced to a minimum of 35 years, and I think he got another 25 years for another murder and attempted abduction and different things like this. He died in prison. And that was it. He was gone. He's never going to tell you anything anyway, Robert Black. He was just a sick man. Sick man. I don't know what caused it. We can have a look, haven't we? We've looked at his childhood. Yes, there was terrible things in his childhood. But a lot of children have a lot worse happen to them than he's had. So Black died of a heart attack on the 12th of January 2016 at the age of 68. His body was created, uh, cremated, uh, um, and then I think, I think he's, it was outside Belfast actually on the 29th of January. There was no family present. There was nothing. There was no service really. No nothing. I think one psalm was was done. That was it. Presbyterian um, chaplain from the prison that done the service, and that was the end of him really. And as with many of these murderers and serial killers and stuff sexual offenders. His ashes were then scattered at sea because you can't bury them anywhere. People don't want them really because they call it sacred ground, okay? For one reason. Second reason is, is because people tried to dig them up. People, people that are like him, and there are many, uh, tried to make a martyr of him, so you know, and so it's best they're buried at sea so there's nothing that can remind us of him. So in 2008, I think the Crown Prosecution Service stated that there was insufficient evidence um, existing in the charge of black with any further murders. That's it. They know he had loads, there's no evidence, and he weren't saying a word. So black has been linked to 14 further murder, child murder charges and disappearances across the UK, Ireland and continental Europe between 1969 and 1989. So this has been the Robert Black case. Shocking, isn't it? Really? Shocking. Well, at least he's dead and gone. But it's a terrible case, and it's a terrible case, and it's terrible for these children, isn't it, really? When you think about their poor families and what these children suffered. So I hope you found this case interesting. You know what to do. You can thumbs up if you liked it. You can subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. My lovely members will be here, uh, Partners in Crime members, and you've noticed I've done the new thumbnail for you. I absolutely love it. Um, down here will be the case that's coming at the weekend. Now, it's, now again, this is a terrible case. This case is called the uh, Nanny Killers. Um, and she was a nanny from um, France that came over to London. So I think it happened in 2017. So it's quite a new case. But again, it's a shocking case. That will be coming out at the weekend. So you know what to do. You can follow me on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram. You can listen to this on podcast in a few days when I have time to do it. Thank you for your lovely comments, my lovely people. And what a controversy we have started, really. This is what I love about YouTube, about doing this. Because when we discuss a case, I leave it open to you, don't I, to make up your own mind. Sometimes I may give my opinion, sometimes. But I love your opinions and I love the way that you just don't follow. You're like, no, I don't think that's right. I don't think, I think this, this. I think it's great because we should all have our own opinions, shouldn't we? And if we all have our own opinions, that's where we find the truth. It's when we all agree that we don't. So thank you. Thank you for all your comments. Thank you for sticking to your own guide of your conscience, what you think happened or not. I love it. So, till the next time. Bye-bye.